But God, indeed, we pray as we have sung and that you would speak this evening. We pray, indeed, that we would not hear simply the voice of men, but the voice of God through that work of the Spirit. Lord, grant me that help to be faithful in what I say and true. Grant us to hear well, each one of us, all that you reveal about yourself to us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I have vivid memories of um, learning to swim as a child. I like swimming very much now, but as a child, um, I was very fearful of water. And uh, I remember my dad taking me to the pool. And as every parent does who's trying to teach their child to swim, he would be sort of trying to teach me what to do with my, my legs and my arms. But I was sort of filled with fear. And, uh, you know, that natural fear that you're going to sink, go under, you're going to drown. And that's when my father would reassure me. He would say, well, you know, you start paddling, moving your arms and legs. My arms will be underneath. You know, you won't go under. You know, aim for the side. Seek to swim. I'm going to let go, but I've got you. I will keep you from sinking. I will keep you from falling. And in many ways, that illustration describes what Jude is saying to us here at the end of his letter. This is a word of reassurance as he closes his short letter. He's saying to us, well, your heavenly Father will not let you fall. He will not let you fail. We've been told to contend for the faith. Last week, we were told to keep ourselves in the love of God. But the message here at the end is that it isn't all down to us, because perhaps that's how we might feel when we hear things like this. Oh, will I make it? Will I, will I, will I do this? Well, the message here at the end is the Lord will keep his people from stumbling. Jude really is finishing as he began. The letter begins and ends. It's sort of bookmarked with words of comfort. Look back to verse 1. And let's remind ourselves of what he had to say to the Christian there right at the beginning. He told us three things about every Christian. He says, you are called. You are beloved. What's the third thing? You are kept for Jesus Christ. So his message at the end is the same as it was at the beginning. Yes, he's, con he's calling us to contend for the truth. He is writing to warn us. He says, watch out for the dangers on the journey of the Christian life. Watch out within the church because false teaching, sadly, is a reality. What did he tell us to do in verses 3 and 4? Well, contend for the faith. He told us what to do. And then really, the bulk of the letter, verses 5 to 19, he's telling us why. Why we need to contend. He says there are false teachers who distort the word of God. They damage the people of God. He reminds us very soberly as well that they are destined for judgment. So this is all very serious stuff. Jude is telling us what to watch out for. He tells us why it's so dangerous. Last Sunday, he told us how to contend. He said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Watch out for yourselves. Watch out for others. And that's what raises the questions, isn't it? Well, will, will I make it to the end? Will, will, will I contend? Will I keep going? Will I endure? Will I remain faithful? I sometimes ask myself that question as a pastor. You know, you see pastoral failures going on and sadly there's been a number you know in recent years that have been quite high profile and you think well will that be me one day will I fail will I be unfaithful Lord will I will I make it to the end Jude says to us well it's not all down to you it's not all down to me the health of this church doesn't simply rest on our shoulders because the God who keeps you uh, who calls you to keep yourself in his love is the God who will keep you from stumbling. Jude isn't finishing with a focus on the false teachers. He's finishing with a focus on the God that we worship. He's finishing with a focus on the truth. His power, his promises, and his position. He's finishing with praise. This is a song at the end, really. A doxology. Proclaiming God's power, his promises, and his position, the God who will keep his people. So there's much to encourage us here. There's been a stern warning in this letter, but there is much comfort at the end to encourage us. Firstly, he reminds us of God's power. 
Now to him, verse 24, now to him who is able. Just stop there for a moment. In other words, Jude is saying to us, God is the guarantee that you will not sink. The book of Jude has reminded us that we are in a fight. The Christian life does have many comforts, but Jude has said you have to contend, that there is a fight on your hands. The gospel will come under attack. God's people will come under attack in every age, every generation, in various ways. Sometimes the problem is legalism. False teachers who add something to the Bible, telling us that we need Jesus plus something else. Now, Paul addresses that problem, for example, in the letter to the Galatians. And it's what a lot of cults do. They distort the word of God. They deny the gospel by adding to it. They say, you must do this, you must do that. Legalism says you you can save yourself. It teaches justification by works, not justification by faith. It denies the grace of God. It denies the gospel. At other times, the problem is license. It's the opposite. And that's really what Jude has been about. People who pervert the grace of God as a license or an excuse for sin. In other words, those who preach a a false kind of freedom. It's seen in those who justify homosexual relationships today who, on the basis, well, God is love. Surely he would permit these things. He is a God of grace and love. These things surely should be fine. Now, certainly God is a God of love, but Jude reminds us he is a God of holiness too. Happiness is not the goal of our life. Our holiness is. That's what the Lord desires for his people. Submission to his good word. Jude says, well, those who pervert the gospel of grace in this way are denying the lordship of Jesus. That's the struggle I think we face more so presently, the issue of license in the church. And so Jude is a timely book. It calls us to contend for the faith, to stand on God's good word, to guard the gospel. But Jude, as I said, is reminding us here at the end, well, the battle ultimately is not yours. It's the Lord's. Left to ourselves, indeed, we would be powerless. Left to ourselves, the church surely would crumble. But we are not left to ourselves. The Lord is in control, and he is able to keep us. History testifies to what Jude is saying here. The story of the church, and I I really recommend that you invest time reading church history because it is so helpful to see how God has been at work in different times and it it shows us that some of the problems we face today are not new. There is nothing new under the sun. The the, the attacks we come under, the church comes under, have happened before on many occasions. The history of the church is littered with compromise, periods of decline, backsliding. And so this problem of false teaching is not new. It's been ever-present On many occasions, it looks like the church will go under, either because of persecution from outside or falsehood from within. And yet, church history is the story of God resurrecting his church, renewing his church, restoring, reviving his people. Yes, there are churches that die. There are denominations that fall by the wayside, but God raises up others. He raises up a faithful people and a church. The Reformation is probably the greatest example in our continent of of the Lord doing that 500 years ago. The Great Awakening of the 18th century in the UK, in America, another. God has repeatedly raised up faithful men and women, believers of courage who have contended for the faith, who stood for the truth at a cost often, but also with great blessing frequently. What was it that made these men so powerful? in their ministry, so persuasive in reforming the church? Well, it was the power of God to him who is able. Paul testifies to the same thing. What made his ministry powerful in that first century? Well, it it wasn't his personality. It wasn't his academic abilities. It's the power of God. He says this in Colossians 1, 28, 29. Him we proclaim, Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, 
struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul clearly had a battle on his hands at times. He so often was dealing with false teaching in his letters and in the churches that he had planted. Ministry was tough, but he says, I wasn't alone. He was completely dependent on the Lord in his ministry in that battle. The final outcome of this battle is in no doubt. God will guard the gospel message. The Lord is able to keep his people afloat. That's really where this power is directed. That's the amazing thing, that it is directed to the preservation of his people. Jude goes on secondly to speak of God's promises in the remainder of verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Now there's not one but two promises in this verse, both of which are amazing for us to be reminded of and to hear, to take to heart. God promises to both protect his people, he also promises that he will perfect them. The first promise concerns what God will do now, the second, what he will do in time to come. One speaks of the journey, the other speaks of the destination. First, God promises to protect us in the present. Now, the danger that Jude is addressing in this letter is that danger of drifting off course, isn't it? Of being deceived. That's what false teaching is. It's hard to spot. It creeps in unnoticed, as he says at the beginning. Because lots of it sounds reasonable. It it borrows the language of the Bible. It sounds spiritual. It takes time to discern that it's a fake. And so it threatens to make us stumble, to make us fall. But God's power is directed to the care of his people. He is like that parent watching over a child, checking the path ahead, you know, as they're they're little and they're toddling around. Letting them walk, but, but keeping them safe. Watching out for our welfare. Now, that's no excuse for us to be lazy. God has given us this letter, hasn't he, to instruct us. We are called to do things, to discern truth from error, to grow mature in our understanding. His word is one of the ways by which he keeps us from stumbling, feeding ourselves on the truth of his word, letting it dwell richly in us, is God's primary means of protecting us. We've been given a meal to eat. We must must feed upon it if we are to be healthy. And so a knowledge of the truth is the best defense against error. But we've also been given the Holy Spirit. We have been given a helper. That's what Jesus promised in John 16 to his disciples. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Spirit isn't separate to the Word. He works through the Word of God. The Bible, we're told, is the sword of the Spirit. That's how Paul describes it, Ephesians 6. That's what we've been given to keep us from stumbling. Again, Paul is using the language of a fight, isn't he? You need armor. You need that sword. You need to to hear the Word of God, to remember truth in order to protect yourself from error. But God's Word also tells us about some other ways that God protects us. It speaks of His providence. In other words, the fact that God is in control, that he uses events and circumstances to, for the good of his people. We heard that in Romans 8 recently on Sunday mornings. Those famous verses, we know that for, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those called according to his purpose. He works all things for good. That includes trials. That includes temptations. Jude is not promising us a a pain-free journey as a believer. And there are times, aren't there, where we, 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 we do feel ourselves falling and stumbling, failing. But by God's grace, he, he picks us back up. He corrects us. His hands direct our wayward steps. They lift us back on our feet. Peter's such a wonderful example of that, isn't he? He is humbled by that failure to confess his knowledge of Jesus just prior to his crucifixion. 
He had promised, remember, to stick with Jesus wherever he went. I will not fail. I will not fall. I'm not one to stumble. I'm sticking next to you, Jesus, wherever you go. He made grand claims for himself, didn't he? No one is going to be more loyal than me. But he learned, he was humbled through that circumstance that his own strength, his own resolve was insufficient. But wonderfully, he was restored, wasn't he? Strengthened by the grace of God for future ministry, the Lord came to him when he was fishing, fed him, asked him those questions, restored him and commissioned him to go and be used. The Lord does the same thing with us so often, doesn't he? Because we do fail so frequently and yet his grace picks us up. But there are other ways in which the Lord protects us in the present. The very fact of what we're doing this evening is is one example. He puts other believers around us. Each one of us is God's gift to one another. We're going to see that in home groups this week as we get the image of the church like a body, interdependent, um, working together, and, and our reliance upon one another for health and strength and growth and maturity. The church isn't perfect. Jude reminds us that great harm can be caused within churches, but also great good. It is the Lord's will that we gather, and he makes us his instruments to protect one another. Look back to what we heard last Sunday, verses 22 and 23. For example, example, he, he uses us to, to bring the wayward back so often, to, to, to look out for one another. Now, that's a help we can see. I mean, the other way, the other thing the Bible speaks of in terms of how God protects us is the unseen. The Scripture speaks of angels, doesn't it, as well? Protecting the people of God. We get little reminders here and there that are mysterious in many ways. And yet the Lord at work to protect his people. Psalm 91 says, God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Hebrews 1.14 speaks of angels as ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. We don't see their work, but the Bible gives us glimpses of their activity. Another little reminder that God is present ever to protect his people, to keep us from stumbling. By his word, through his people, by his providence, by his angels, all under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is with us in the present to guard us, to protect us. But there's that second promise as well, isn't it, in this verse, verse 24. He will protect us now. He promises to present us as perfect before his presence in the future. In other words, one day this fight is going to be finished. It will be over. One day the imperfect will be replaced by the perfect. One day the journey will be over. The destination will be reached. That's what we're being protected for to come into his presence. Jude is reminding us what what we're saved for. It, it, It is for relationship. It is that we come into the presence of God. Not to live for ourselves. That's essentially the outcome of those who are perverting the grace of God. They are perverting it in order to justify living for themselves, doing what they want as a license for sin. We're not saved to do as we please. We are saved to serve the Lord, to know the Lord, to live for the Lord. As I said, our goal, his goal for us is not our happiness, it's our holiness. And that's what Jude says we will experience one day. We will be holy in a way that we don't experience now. We are holy already. We are sanctified as a people. But one day we will experience that in all its fullness. For now, we are fighting against the falsehood In this life, we are fighting against the sin within, aren't we? Our sinful natures. But one day Jude says, well, all that will be over. You will be presented perfect. The Lord's power is at work to protect and to perfect you. Because, why? Well, we are precious to him. The letter begins, and notice how many times he uses this word. He says, you are beloved. I noticed that as we read through it again here. The number of times Jude says, calls these believers beloved. He's reminding them what they are before the Lord, how he sees them. And he ends by speaking of the great joy that will accompany our arrival. You will come before the presence of his glory with great joy. Jude says this day is not a possibility, 
It is a certainty. And again, there's echoes of Romans 8 here, where we're told, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why is it certain? Because God is able. He is powerful. And because God keeps his promises. Now Jude isn't just telling us these things. He is, he is praising the Lord here. He is inviting us to sing with him. This is a doxology as it says. He is praising God for his power, for his promises. But thirdly, his position. That's what he points us to thirdly, verses, uh, verse 25. To the only God. Our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. What is Jude wanting us to see? The authority of God. Because that's been the fundamental issue at the heart of the letter. That's the fundamental mark of a false teacher. They are not making Jesus Lord. They are marked by disobedience. They deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. That's how Jude described them in verse 4. They failed to recognize God's position. Jude says there is only one God, and it's not us. He says there's only one Savior, Jesus Christ, and he is to be your Lord. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. All these words are describing a king, aren't they? To give him glory is to adore him. It's to honor him, celebrate him, exalt him, rejoice in him. Majesty speaks of his position over all things, his supreme position as ruler over creation. Dominion makes reference to his power. It has no boundary. We think of our king, don't we? King Charles, we describe him as his majesty. He has a realm, but it has borders. His authority has a limit, but not God's. It is boundless. He exercises authority over all things. Jude wants us to be clear about the truth here at the end. He wants us to be clear about the Lord. He speaks of the destiny of God's people But the destiny is very different for rebels. Jude has spoken bluntly of the judgment on the disobedient. Verse 13 is really clear. Speaks of the gloom of utter darkness that has been reserved forever. What a wonderful and yet terrifying thing God's power is. It it secures the believer. It condemns the unbeliever. It's a serious thing to mess with the word of God, to distort it. To deny the lordship of Christ, we're told. God is truly the king. His rule is total and complete. It's not temporary, it's not occasional, it's permanent and eternal. Before all time and now and forever. It's past, it's present, it's future. That's what Jude says. God is without equal. He is without rival. And so what a foolish thing it is for Satan to challenge his rule. What a foolish thing it is for man to attempt to take the throne, to say, God, I know better than you. That's effectively what happens with false teachers. Well, I don't really like this part of the Bible. I'm going to throw it out because I know better than you, God. That happens so often today in subtle ways, and we, we need to watch out for it. You know, not only what people say, but what they don't say, because often what they don't say is more indicative of what they believe, sadly. And that's the mark of a false teacher, what they are cutting out of God's word. And so Jude is lifting our eyes from our problems to the one who has all power. The power to keep you from stumbling. The power to present you perfect in his presence. The power to destroy his enemies. That's why Jude is finishing with praise. He is concerned by false teaching, but he's also supremely confident. 
the God who calls you to contend for the faith is the God who ultimately is in control. The God who calls you to keep in his love is the God who will keep his people from falling. Last week, John shared with us, you know, how our building project at times over the summer seemed overwhelming, or too overwhelming. He testified to the the provision of God at various points to sort of keep things going and provide things at various times to, to reassure him in the midst of maybe doubts on occasions as to whether things would come together. Now, we've probably all felt the same way at times about our walk with the Lord. Am I going to make it to the end? Am I going to stumble and fall? Will I endure? Will I contend? Can I contend? Who is sufficient to the task? None of us, but God is. He is able to keep you from stumbling. He will present you as blameless before his glorious presence. That's why we sing. That's why we praise the Lord. To him be the glory, the honor, and praise. He is the keeper of his people. He is the king who rules over all things. And one day we will come into his presence with great joy. It will be a day of celebration. We are precious to him, and he has power to keep his people. So Jude says to us here at the end, remember the truth. Remember who the Lord is. Remember his character, his nature, his promises, his power, his position. That is your best defense against error, to see him as you seek to discern truth from error and to protect yourself in the church from falsehood. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to him we give the glory. Let me pray let's, and, and praise the Lord for his grace. And perhaps a few of us, let's have a time of, we've got a, a little bit of time left. Let's have a time of open prayer. Perhaps you'd like to lead us in giving thanks and praise to the Lord. Let's use the doxology. Let's 